The America's Democrats podcast, a project of 21st century Democrats, is made possible by contributions from our listeners. Want to do more? Go to americasdemocrats.org and click donate. And thank you for allowing us to be your voice. And if you enjoy the show, please share it with your friends on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. This week, a history of the gig economy and the rise and fall of secure work. Plus, why America needs a new social contract between business and society. And Bill Press talks border politics with Congressman Ruben Gallego. Had enough of Fox News, the House Freedom Caucus, and Donald Trump? If you want the facts that you won't get from them or from the fake news sites of the alt-right, then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. In his newest book, labor historian Lewis Hyman tells the story of America's transformation to a temp economy and why he calls it the moral crisis of work in the 21st century. And we say hello to Lewis Hyman, historian of work and business at the ILR School of Cornell University, where he also directs the Institute for Workplace Studies in New York City. He is the author of several books. His most recent is Temp, How American Work, American Business, and the American Dream Became Temporary. Lewis Hyman, thank you so much for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. A real pleasure. Thanks for having me. And our pleasure to have you with us. Your book is a reminder of a different era in the American workplace uh, before we got to the so-called gig economy, a time of greater stability for employees. For our listeners who have only known the gig economy, uh, how was that earlier time different? I mean, imagine a a world where if you were loyal to your boss, uh, he would be loyal to you. Imagine a world where you were paid enough and, in fact, those wages rose every year. And this world that was created in the aftermath of World War II really delivered a lot of benefit to working people, um, whether they worked in factories or in offices, in a way that had never really happened before in American capitalism. Now, an important distinction that you make is that this stability was not intended for all workers. Who was left out? And this is a crucial caveat to that rosy picture we have of post-war work. Because, of course, African Americans, women, um, people who were not American citizens were, but yet lived here, were left out of that security, and very explicitly so. So the kinds of jobs that African American women had that people who were migrants had were left out of most of the labor law. And so it was a world of white men. So whether that, those white men were working class, whether those white men were middle class, it was a world of security. And so for people to partake in that security, if they weren't white men, required marrying them. So, you know, there was a way in which white women were part of this stability too, but in a very contingent way, in a way that that depended on access to men. And so as we think about the post-war, we have to be very conscious that this part of it, uh, the security, was grounded in a very particular sense of who deserves security. And in fact, a very large swath of the population was not included. I mean, just given the two groups that you mentioned, people of color and, and women. Exactly. So more than half of Americans were not included in that security. And it, and that leaving people out of that security sets the stage for the transformations that happened in the workforce in the 1970s and 80s. Now, you describe several important turning points that gave rise to where we are now. One is a shift in the way corporations thought about the workforce. That started in the 1960s. What changed? So the book is a labor history, but it's also a business history. It's a story of how managers thought about the best way to run their corporations. And this, there's a real shift in the 1960s as a new kind of corporation emerges called the conglomerate that really believes in managerial science that they can manage anything no matter how big it is. And so corporations begin to buy up other corporations. They get bigger and bigger and bigger. And this is lauded as the future of American capitalism. 
But then it all falls apart. It all falls apart in 1969, and it turns out that while they had been getting bigger, they hadn't been getting more profitable. And in the aftermath of that, there is a total reimagination of how corporations should work. So if you think about the, the way we talk about lean corporations today, we talk about them as being small and nimble and agile and somehow being small is better than being big. And this just wouldn't have been logical at all uh, to anyone before 1970. The big corporations had the resources, the big corporations had the talent, and this is just a total reorientation of how we think about work. We're speaking with Lewis Hyman, historian of work and business at the ILR School of Cornell University. He's the author of several books, the most recent, Temp, How American Work, American Business, and the American Dream Became Temporary. Uh, Lewis, you also give us a fascinating history of two organizations that were important actors, Manpower, the temporary staffing agency, and McKinsey, the management consulting company. What was their role? So in the history that I wrote, it's really telling the story of the rise and fall of secure work through the story of different kinds of temporary workers, whether those are management consultants or office temps or unpaid, um, unpaid, um, can I start that over? Mm -hmm. So as I tell the story of temp, I'm telling it through a variety of different kinds of workers. And some of those people are temporaries who are management consultants, who are office temps and who are migrant laborers. And two of, those, two of those kinds of workers are really encapsulated by Manpower, which is the first major temporary agency, and McKinsey, which is the sort of quintessential management consulting firm. And I tell the story of this both to tell the story of certain varieties of temporary workers, but also because they're so important in transforming the corporation. Manpower's founder, Elmer Winter, spends a lot of his time trying to educate corporations on why they need to not have job security in the workplace, how to subcontract out vast swaths of their workforce to temp agencies. And McKinsey, of course, is instrumental in reorganizing firms after the conglomerate crisis of 1969 and really setting the stage for how CEOs, how the C-suite, how business leaders in general should think about the proper way to organize the corporation. And this is crucial to understanding the sort of unraveling of the job security of the post-war. So this was just a, the, the beginning of the slow erosion of, of what we once knew and has now become what we refer to as the gig economy? Exactly. And, and I think oftentimes the story that we're told is that we can blame the economists. But if you read through the documents of businesses, they don't talk about Hayek. They don't talk about Friedman. Friedman. They talk about McKinsey. They talk about manpower. They talk about the business leaders of the time. And this is where those ideas circulate and come from. And, you know, it's not a vast conspiracy. It's just people trying to figure out how to make another buck. And, it's interesting to think about how that sort of almost banal part of how corporations run really tears apart American society. Mm -hmm. Now, you also wrote about Silicon Valley, and hey, without which we may not have Uber, among other things. But their role, of course, is bigger than that. Yes. Yeah, so it's funny. Silicon Valley is, is a funny thing because we tend to think of it as being very recent. And we've thought about it being recent for a very long time. So, of course, Silicon Valley really emerges with the rise of the electronics industry in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And in the 1970s, where I write a lot about Silicon Valley in the book, it's a place where, in the aftermath of the failure of the conglomerates, a new roadmap to capitalism is being created, a new idea about how to run corporations without labor unions, how to run corporations using migrant industrial labor, and how to make profits from that. And the story of Silicon Valley is really important because the way in which work is not valued and workers are not valued, the way in which is in the DNA of Silicon Valley, that workers are disposable, that they are a transitional workforce to a future where robots will make everything work. 
And the book I write about the beginning of Apple, actually, which in 1984 had its very first Macintosh factory and claimed it was machines building machines. Well, it was actually women, mostly women of color, making those first Macs. And to understand Silicon Valley is simple. Every time someone says robot, they usually mean a woman of color. And it was true in the 1980s, and it's true today. That's something I hadn't heard before, and I, 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 I find that somewhat disturbing. Um, we're speaking with Lewis Hyman, historian of work and business at the ILRL, I, ILR School of, of Cornell University, uh, and of course the author of Temp, which is part of our discussion today. So here we are today, Lewis. I mean, how pervasive is this evolved temp economy, and, and, and what does it mean for workers' lives? Well, I think, you know, whether you're a W-2 worker, um, you know, whether you're a 1099 worker, whether you work for a big corporation or a startup, um, you, you feel insecure. I think workers today do not feel that if they put in their best effort, they're guaranteed to have a job in the future. And this is a long history, right? I mean, we've been talking about this in the 1980s with the industrialization, in the 90s with downsizing. And the aughts and the teens, now we're talking about the gig economy. So this is actually a long history in the transformation of work. And it's not just about technology. So we often talk, we start with talking about Uber, and it seems futuristic. But Uber is really only possible because the rest of the service economy is so bad. People drive for Uber because they can't get enough shifts at Starbucks, or they don't get paid enough at Walmart. And it's that reality that is left out of the conversation a lot, that even if you have a so-called regular job, your life is still very uncertain. And I think that we are in the moment where people are trying to think, well, how do we create security and how do we create independence? So there's nothing necessarily bad about being an independent worker or a gig worker. It's just that it doesn't provide security. Well, Neither does regular work. So we are at a moment where we really need to rethink how the, all of that is done, whether through law or institutions like unions or through social norms, um, through consumer activism. There's a lot of different paths we can take. But if we want to make capitalism work for all of us, we need to stand together and, and really change how this is happening. Well, you know, the other thing, too, is that this goes beyond paychecks and health insurance. You know, it's also about that sense of meaning and purpose in work. And that's kind of difficult to do when you're forced to go out and do something else because what you were trying to do full time ain't cutting it for you. Yeah. And of course, a lot of people, their full time jobs are terrible, right? I mean, this is this is not, uh, you know, this is one of the big trade offs in the history of industrialization. We got better checks, but, you know, we stood there all day turning wrenches. And that's soul breaking work. And, you know, it's proud work. You can be proud of what you do, provide for your family. But it also is something that no human really wants to turn a wrench for eight hours a day. And so as we think about technology, we need to think about it as how do we liberate people from doing the jobs that a machine should be doing and not a person. And at the same time, how when that person doesn't have that job anymore, they can still feel safe and secure and eat and love and learn. And I think that is, this is the big moral crisis of work in the 21st century, how to make the technology work for us, not just work us over. Now, even though our conversation has gone the direction it has gone, it has been noted with some surprise by some who have reviewed your book that you are actually somehow optimistic about the future of work. So where does that come from? Well, I think that there is something pretty exciting about being alive now. I mean, I'm not nostalgic for sitting at a desk in an office. I'm not nostalgic for um, a sexist, racist economy or for working in a factory line. I think that all people have the capacity to care, to be curious. And I think that liberating people from tedium is one of the great, amazing things about living in this moment. The fact that you know, most of us don't have to bring in the harvest um, and sort of drudge in the fields. I mean, even farmers don't. That's all mechanized. So I think this is one of the exciting things about right now. And if we make it work right, if they're, and in the, in the book I have policies that are both conservative and liberal, um, there's ways of making this work so that this crossroads in how the corporation is being organized 
can be a moment of liberation, not immiseration. And I think that is something that we need right now. We need not just to say it's bad, but how can we make it better? Lewis Hyman, historian of work and business at the ILRR School of Cornell University, where he also directs the Institute for Workplace Studies in New York City, and of course the author of several books. What we've been talking about today is Temp, How American Work, American Business, and the American Dream Became Temporary. Lewis, thank you so much for your time with us today on America's Democrats podcast. We look forward to having you back again with us soon. Thanks so much. You're quite welcome. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen to this americasdemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st century Democrats. But we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This social security measure. I believe that we must pass legislation to provide medical care. This is our tradition. When our grandparents came to America, it was the Democratic Party which said, Welcome. It was the Democratic Party, the party of Roosevelt and Truman and Kennedy and others, who said that America belonged to all its people, not just a handful of the rich or a few giant corporations. That's why great leaders like FDR fought so hard for Social Security, and why JFK stood up to the insurance companies and their Republican allies to get Medicare. It's not just one thing, or one time, in one place. It's about a whole history of standing up to the Republicans and saying someone has to be on the side of regular working people in America. Whether it's defending Social Security or just the way your loved ones are treated on the job, that's what the Democratic Party is all about. And that's why this message has been brought to you by the Democratic Party. Working people like you and me. Paid for by 21st Century Democrats. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. Coming up next, the failures of American capitalism and can it survive? But first, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. In a recent two-panel cartoon, a character holds a sign saying, first, they came for the reporters. In the next panel, his sign says, we don't know what happened after that. It was, of course, a retort to Donald Trump's ignorant campaign to demonize the news media as, quote, the enemy of the people. But the worst enemy of America's local and regional newspapers is not our ranting president, but a new breed of fast buck hucksters who've scooped up hundreds of America's newspapers from the bargain bins of media sell-offs. The buyers are hedge fund scavengers with nondescript names like Digital First and Gatehouse. They know nothing about journalism and care less, for they're Wall Street profiteers out to grab big bucks fast by slashing the journalistic staffs of each paper, voiding all employee benefits, shriveling the paper's size and news content, selling the presses and other assets, tripling the price of their inferior product, then declaring bankruptcy, shutting down the paper and auctioning off the bones before moving on to plunder another town's paper. America's two largest newspaper chains today are not venerable publishers with a basic commitment to civic responsibility, but Gatehouse and Digital First, whose managers believe that good journalism is measured by the personal profits they can squeeze from it. As revealed last year in an American Prospect article, Gatehouse executives had demanded that his papers cut $27 million from their operating expenses, eliminating jobs and slashing paychecks. Meanwhile, one employee, the hedge fund CEO, extracted $54 million in personal pay from the conglomerate, including an $11 million bonus. This is Jim Hightower saying, To these absentee Wall Street owners, newspapers are no more than big pipelines, a means of hauling enormous financial wealth and social well-being out of our communities. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. 
This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. At a time when American capitalism leaves more and more people behind, many question if it's worth saving. Stephen Perlstein is one of our nation's leading economists. In his newest book, he argues for a return to the core value of shared prosperity if capitalism is to sustain over the long term. And we say hello to Stephen Perlstein, Pulitzer Prize-winning business and economics columnist for The Washington Post, also Robinson Professor of Public and International Affairs at George Mason University. And he is the author of Can American Capitalism Survive? Stephen Perlstein, thank you so much for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. My pleasure. Our pleasure to have you with us. The subtitle of your book is Why Greed is Not Good, Opportunity is Not Equal, and Fairness Will Not Make Us Poor. Starting with greed, how has greed infected capitalism? Well, we want to be careful not to be naive about this. Um, We're all greedy. Uh, Even people um, who think they're socialists are greedy. Uh, When they when they prefer uh, cheaper products, they're greedy. When they when they prefer being paid more than they are now, um, they're greedy. Um, greed, uh, that we're a little greedy. Greed, of course, is, is taking that uh, to an excess. And um, we used to sort of understand uh, we had a business culture and a culture that understood uh, that greed was bad. But starting in the 1980s, um, we started to embrace another idea, which is that that greed is good. That it that there is no uh, that if everyone um, simply looks out for number one for himself financially, that we have this system called capitalism that marvelously um, produces outcomes that are not only the best for the person who is acting greedy, but is, is, is optimal for everyone else in society. That's the invisible hand um, that uh, people refer to. Um, we, are, uh, we, 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 as Adam Smith said, um, it is not out of uh, kindness or generosity that the butcher and the baker give us uh, our meat and our bread, but out of their own self-interest. And when we all act that way, um, the economy acts uh, in the most efficient way, and we all benefit from that. Uh, that's true uh, up to a point, but if you go too far in that and, and we stop trusting each other and start cooperating, stop cooperating with each other um, and start uh, not understanding that what's good uh, – what's good for the whole is good for everybody. When we stop realizing that, then we've pushed that system too far. And, and why is it so important to state that opportunity is not equal? Well, because th- the people who what I call market fundamentalists um, have always said, look, we don't need to worry about equality of outcomes, which is a fancy way of saying equality of income and wealth that all we need to do is, from a moral standpoint, uh, is worry about equality of opportunity. If everyone has the same opportunity then to run the race, then we really shouldn't uh, morally or even economically care that some people do a lot better than others. Um, that, that that competitive system is what uh, produces uh, the best outcomes for everybody. The problem is that equality of opportunity is not possible. And it's not possible because of nature and nurture. Um, and the simplest way to say that is that the difference in income between any two people that you would pick up randomly on the street, half of that difference can be explained by who their parents were in terms of what they, what they inherited genetically, uh, the talents uh, and health uh, that they inherited and, and, and traits that they inherited genetically, but also what, uh, what they gained in the early years of their life from their family life. And those two things explain half the difference. If that's true and if that's irreducible, then there never can be equality of opportunity, and we have to understand that. We can do better about that, and we have done better over the years on that, on that score, but we can, never, uh, we can never get anywhere close to um, perfectly equal opportunity. And if that's the case, then maybe if we're unhappy with the, with the inequality of outcomes, then maybe we have to deal with that directly. Mm-hmm. 
Now, regarding fairness, the subtitle suggests that some people think fairness will make us poor. Do you see this as a, a drift from what the founders imagined when they said all men are created equal? No, I don't think it has much to do with the founders. It has to do with economics. Um, there has been, in economics generally, a presumption that there is an absolute trade-off. You can create a society that is more equal by changing rules and laws and norms, but you do so, you are sacrificing some economic growth. And so there's a trade-off. If you want more growth, you have to have less equality. If you, if you want more equality, you have to have less, have less growth. And different societies make different trade-offs. What I demonstrate in the book, based on, I'm not an economist, but I play one on radio and television, uh, but what, what real economists have determined is that there is a point at which that trade-off is not necessarily true. That if things get so unequal, that in fact, you can get more growth if you make them less unequal. There's a sort of curve, and we in the United States are certainly on the wrong side of that, um, of that curve. We're beyond the sweet spot. And so for us, less inequality might actually mean, or more equality might actually mean more growth. Now, if you go to a highly socialistic uh, country, that trade-off probably still exists, that if they had less equality, they could have more growth. Uh, but we're we're on the other side of that sweet spot in the United States. Hmm. We're speaking with Stephen Perlstein, Pulitzer Prize winning business and economics columnist for The Washington Post, professor of public and international affairs at George Mason University and author of Can American Capitalism Survive? You also talk, Stephen, about neoliberalism as the root of, of much of capitalism's problems. What are some of the specific neoliberal tenets that we should be questioning? I should say, Jim, that I never use the word neoliberal because I'm old enough to remember when neoliberal um, meant sort of center-left moderate. Uh, and, and I'm a neoliberal, but the way neoliberal is used now, it's, it's meant to refer to Thatcherism or Reaganism. Um, uh, but what I call it market fundamentalism. And th some of the tenets are that one, greed is good. And, uh, and one manifestation of that is that uh, that the purpose of all companies is to maximize their profits. Uh, and that is um, something that is widely embraced in corporate America today and taught in business schools and even taught in law schools. It, uh, it isn't a legal requirement, but people think that it is. Uh, so that's one of the bad ideas. The other uh, bad idea is that, um, that the incomes that each of us earns in the marketplace, this is before taxes, that that is a objective and accurate reflection of each of our economic contribution. And so it's, it's, it's what's sometimes referred to as our just dessert. And if any attempt to redistribute that money is something akin to theft. Um, I made that, I deserve that, and the market is an objective uh, calculator of the value of our input. And uh, that's one of the tenets of neoliberalism, as you call it, market fundamentalism, as I call it. And it turns out that that's not true, um, that what we earn in the marketplace is to a degree a reflection of our eco each of our economic contribution, but it's also a reflection of all sorts of rules and laws and norms that are used uh, in the economy and particularly within companies to distribute uh, the the amount of the, the income that we produce. And you could change those norms and laws uh, and rules and get a very different distribution of income. And in fact, that's why uh, things are more equal in places like Sweden or France or Germany, because they do have different laws and rules. And that doesn't mean that their machinist is less or more productive than our uh, machinist. It means that we have a sort of different way of dividing the pie. Mm -hmm. So it's not an objective measure. It's a highly subjective measure, in fact, and it's very political. Uh, and there is no pure, uh, there is, by the way, no purely objective measure because there is no system, uh, there's no market system that operates without rules. Uh, and as soon as you have some rules, that determines to a degree the distribution of income. 
Uh, now, the other the other thing that is embraced, uh, you asked what other things, one of them is that there is this absolute trade-off between fairness and growth, and we've talked about that. Uh, so, and then another is that equality of opportunity is um, uh, all we need to worry about, and, uh, and I think that we've talked about why that's not true. Those are the four tenets of neoliberalism that we embraced in the 1980s, for a good reason, by the way. We were we were becoming a very uncompetitive economy uh, in the early 1980s, and uh, there was a lot of talk about us going the way of the British, um, a declining uh, empire, a declining economy, and and that Japan would surpass us and Germany would, and in fact that didn't happen. But and the reason it didn't happen is that we did get leaner and meaner, and we needed to get a little leaner and meaner. We didn't need to get as mean and ruthless as we have subsequently become. Mm -hmm. Now, something else, your book assumes capitalism is worth the effort and has the self-correcting measures to fix itself. Many progressives may take issue with that. What's your response? Well, I would say in a democratic capitalist society, we have the, the correcting mechanisms. Um, there are some me correcting mechanisms within economics itself, within a market system itself. But I guess what I, uh, I would argue is a lot of that depends on those rules, norms, uh, and regulations. And uh, that requires uh, some changes in laws uh, through, through the democratic process. Having said that, I will also say that a lot of this is, has to do with social norms. That is, the behavior of businesses today is different than the behavior of businesses, um, you know, when I was growing up in the 50s and 60s. And a lot of that difference is attributed to what is considered acceptable behavior. And what was considered acceptable beha unacceptable behavior in the 50s is now considered acceptable. Um, and how norms change is actually rather mysterious. But I'll give you an example of a changing norms, which is the Me Too movement. A lot of behavior that used to go on in companies having to do with the uh, uh, treatment of, of women uh, was accept what used to be acceptable and, and commonplace, uh, even if it was some people didn't like it. Uh, now, rather quickly, we've changed the norms on that. And we need to think about the norms that go on in business. For example, maximizing shareholder value. That was not the norm in the 50s. It is now. And there's nothing legal about that. It's just something we came to accept. And we can now change that. We can now say, look, I'm not going to go work for a company uh, that doesn't share its profits with employees. I'm not going to do business with a company uh, that rapes uh, the environment. And uh, I'm not going to do business with a company that treats its workers badly. And that will change the norms of what is acceptable behavior on the part of businesses. And we don't need to have a law to do that. We just need to we just sort of need to enforce it in all the informal ways um, that we can enforce these things uh, through the economy as consumers, as investors, as workers. You argue for a new social contract that can redeem capitalism. So let's talk about some of the specific policies that you see that could, in fact, do that. Well, one would be that uh, companies, uh, if they're going to if they're going to get favorable tax treatments for their share buybacks and their executive compensation schemes, that they they have to um, have a system of sharing uh, e their profits with their their employees and spending as much on that as they do on those other things, which essentially benefit executives and shareholders. So that would be one. Uh, a second would be. Um, my version of universal basic income, I call it a citizen's dividend. And the way I like to frame it is that we all benefit from this wonderful system that makes ours the richest uh, country in the world. Uh, and none of us had anything to do with creating that system. We were all born into it. And so we all should get a dividend every year to reflect that. At the same time, we're all part of this wonderful system. We have an obligation and responsibility to it. And so I think that we should pair uh, a, a modest UBI, by the way, with... Um, 
with universal serv- uh, public service, that everyone should uh, spend three years during their lifetime. It doesn't have to be when you're young. It could be when you're old or in your middle age. Three years in, in doing some sort of public uh, service, either th- through the government or more likely through some sort of um, nonprofit. Um, so that would be the way I would frame that, and I would make that $3,000 a year per person, and I would make it $6,000 a year for working people or people who are full-time students. Um, uh, uh, I, sh- I should say full-time students beyond high school. Um, and that a UBI that is framed that way would ensure that anyone, including a minimum wage worker at today's minimum wage, uh, even if they had several children, even if they were a single uh, mom or dad, would be uh, above the poverty line. Again, we're speaking with Stephen Perlstein, Pulitzer Prize-winning business and economics columnist for The Washington Post, Robinson Professor of Public and International Affairs at George Mason University, and author of Can American Capitalism Survive? Now, what I just heard, and perhaps this is a, a, a change in the definition of the word, but some of the policies you talk about are getting branded in some circles as socialist. Weigh in on that if you well, will. Well, uh, you know... Uh, I, you know, those are semantic problems. When I think of socialism, uh, and I'm old enough to remember when countries really were socialist, uh, the, the government owned owned companies. They owned entire industries. They heavily regulated um, prices. Uh, uh, there were a lot of public utilities that were heavily regulated, and they regulated the prices. They, they, we used to regulate in this country which airlines could fly to which cities and what they could charge, uh, and how much money they could make every year. Uh, we still do that with local phone service, for example. Um, but th- that, to me, is socialism. Uh, socialism is also highly redistributive, but, you know, we have a progressive tax system now in the United States. Uh, in fact, uh, although liberals don't like to hear this, the the progressivity of our tax code, at least before the Donald Trump tax code, um, the progress- progressivity of our tax code is not all that different than the progressivity of the tax code uh, in places we think of as uh, much more socialistic, like Sweden and uh, Germany. The problem is that the we, we, ours is just as progressive, but the rates are much lower. So in other words, we, we have a progressive system, but we don't raise that much money th- uh, through it. Um, and, uh, you know, that is the big difference. So, you know, we've always had some forms of welfare and re- redistribution. We have food stamps. We have a progressive tax code. We, we have the earned income tax credit. Uh, so where the line is between socialistic and capitalistic, you know, I, I don't know. That, that, that's something people can decide in, 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 at universities. For practical reasons, we have a mixed system. Uh, and I'm just suggesting a, a, a system that is mixed in slightly different ways. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a capitalist. I'm a proud capitalist. I'll, I'll say that. I, I, I think we need what we need to do is save capitalism from some of the capitalists. Mm. Now, socialist labels aside, do you believe we can muster the political will to renew our social contract? Yes, I'm pretty sure that we're in the process of doing that now. Uh, you know, you, we don't. None of us much likes uh, what's going on in, during the Trump years in, in Washington. But um, that's that was the first somewhat incohate uh, populist revolt against capitalism running off the moral rails uh, and the economic rails. Uh, and he has no solution to it. But but he he was able to. Um, take advantage of the the feeling the broad feeling that somehow the system isn't working for enough people uh and we'll get to phase two of that i think in 2020 stephen perlstein pulitzer prize winning business and economics columnist for the washington post joining us today on the america's democrats podcast talking about his book can american capitalism survive stephen we appreciate your time with us today look forward to having you back again with us soon thanks for having me You're quite welcome. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to keep the America's Democrats dot org podcast, a project of 21st century Democrats on the air and help elect stand up Democrats. 
go to americasdemocrats.org and click on donate at the top of the page. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. And now Bill Press talks with Arizona Congressman Ruben Gallego on the absurdity of President Trump's wall and his national emergency at the border. Uh, pleasure to welcome to the studio, uh, representing now in his fifth, for the fifth straight year in Congress, Arizona's 7th Congressional District, the great city of Phoenix, Arizona, Congressman Ruben Gallego. Congressman, good to see you. Thank you for having me. Uh, nice to see a Democrat from a red state. But we, are, we are not a red state. We're a purple state and quickly turning say, blue. Yeah, yeah. Arizona's really, really coming around. We huh? are. I mean, we have four statewide elected Democrats. We almost picked up the state house. We have five Democrats out of nine elected to members of Congress. Uh, we're going to. I didn't turn realize blue. the delegation was five out of nine. Now, Absolutely. Huh? Yeah, we have this right. thing called independent redistricting, which you know, uh, the rest of the country, if they did, I think would be much better off too. Right. And a new Democratic senator. And a new Democratic right. senator. Yeah. So congratulations. That's thank you. Good. Thank you. You, you're, you're helping lead the way there. I'm I doing my it. best. Yeah. <laughs> what what is from as a border state? What do you see the impact would be were Donald Trump to close the border as he threatens to do? Well, like, it would it would number, it would first just throw Arizona into a, a recession right away. We depend heavily on Mexico, uh, especially uh, the state of Sonora. They're our biggest trading partner. Uh, we import food. We import, you know, uh, different types of equipment. We import just shoppers. Rich Mexicans come and shop on the American side and vice versa. We go on this. It would just destroy the American uh, economy first in Arizona, eventually the rest of the country. You know, auto parts are made in Mexico and shipped up to Michigan. Uh, if you don't have those auto parts, they're not going to just be able to get them from anywhere right away. They would actually probably end up shutting down. And when there's a supply gap in terms of cars, then people are going to go buy foreign cars. So, uh, Trump's idea is just, I mean, just plain stupid. Uh, only someone that was born in New York and does not understand border politics <laughs> would think that this is a good idea. Uh, and in terms of, I mean, there are people who go back and forth either for school or for jobs, right? I mean, in, yeah, I mean, I mean for mean, Arizona your state and yeah. California too, but California, Texas, uh, New Mexico, there's people that go back and forth for vacation, for food, for medical care. Uh, we're talking legal migration and and business yeah. and just business. Uh, you know, you have, for example, part you know, uh, uh, some of our aerospace uh, industry is based in uh, Mexico, uh, so we'd have parts that would not be fulfilled. You know, for some of our biggest uh, uh, you know producers of aerospace goods. So it, it just makes no sense. And again, it just shows how small minded and I think ignorant uh, the Trump administration and Trump in in uh, Trump himself. Uh, uh, are when it comes to the thinking, where they're, they're thinking of the border. Uh, and it, reportedly today, uh, his economic, top economic advisors are telling him this, but he doesn't seem to be listening. Um, so this is a I, man that actually somehow was able to bankrupt a casino. Uh, I doubt that uh, he's going <laughs> to listen to anybody, and he could quickly bankrupt a, a, a good economy right now. <laughs> yeah, I guess if you can bankrupt a casino, uh, that says something about your about your business skills, I yes. guess, right? Uh, in terms of the flow of illegal immigration, uh, this is something that I know coming from California, mm -hmm. the border states have been dealing with um, a long time. Um, and is Donald Trump's wall the answer? Well, clearly not, because you see what's happening right now are people that are presenting themselves uh, for refugee status. So even if you put up this useless wall, people are just going to go to the border points of, of entry and just introduce themselves, you know, and ask for refugee status. So that's clearly not going to take any, uh, the wall's not going to do anything to stop the, the human flow of refugees. Uh, there's so many better ways to do this that require, you know, you know, tact, nuance, and leadership, which is something that this administration does not have. Uh, but it would actually end up stopping uh, or slowing down this, this refugee flow because there's two types of uh, immigrants mm -hmm. that are crossing the border mm -hmm. right now. Uh, obviously, there's three, I should say. There's your legal immigrants, workday work work, uh, work workers, people that are just coming in and going out. Uh, there's people that are, are entering without permission uh, between ports of entry. Uh, and then you have people that are representing, representing themselves as refugees. Uh, and those are largely from Central and South Amer Central America. Uh, and that would not stop, a wall would not stop any of that. Uh, what a wall does is fulfills his campaign promise. That's all he cares about. It, this has nothing to do with, you know, stopping uh, "quote unquote" illegal immigration or stopping refugees. It's just it's just him having an ego trip, trying to uh, make sure he fulfills a campaign promise. Is actually not going to do anything. Right. Uh, what are the people of Arizona? What are your 
constituents. What are you hearing from your constituents about? I mean, we're used to the shtick. I mean, we've been talking about the wall. I'm glad Republic- you said the shtick. I thought you might say something else. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's a family show still, it's Bill. A it's show. a family know, show still. Yeah, I'm the one who usually it, goes it, over the line. Yeah, 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 yeah. You don't have to worry about the guests usually. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm a marine, but I got to tame myself too. Um, look, you know, I I got elected to the Arizona State Legislature in 2010. We've been hearing this. BS forever about the border, about the border wall. We actually had some ridiculous state senator put together a you know nonprofit to you know take donations to build a border wall. Does that actually oh, sound familiar? Right. Yes. This is 2010. Of course, yeah. that money ended up going nowhere. Uh, we've everything you're seeing right now at the national level we saw in Arizona. Uh, so this is why it doesn't. We, it's just not as believable. Democrats and Republicans, and Independents didn't believe all these scare tactics they used last election cycle because we've seen it all. Right. And we understand the border is a more human dimension uh, than some idea of a wall. We understand that walls don't work. Uh, they can work in certain areas. But this idea that a wall is going to be our end all be all save all of uh, when it comes to our, our very complex border immigration is ridiculous. It requires mm-hmm. a multifaceted approach uh, that this president just is not capable of doing. At one time, a, a multifaceted approach that even I remember when George W. Bush had his comprehensive member that we talked about comprehensive immigration right. reform. Right. Groups. It's a comprehensive problem. There's many ways to do this, but one, one, right. one shot's not going to do it. Right. Um, I also would lo- love to get your take on one thing. that So this threat to shut down the border on the part of Donald Trump, um, uh, and despite the ad- contradictory advice he's getting from s- his economic advisors, uh, follows up on something he did over the weekend, which was cut off aid to uh, <laughs> Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. Right. Um, smart move. No, not at all. Actually, you're only going to increase more uh, uh, immigration flows here, refugee flows. The, the smart thing to do is actually do two things. Number one, help stabilize those Central American regions. We had a program going uh, under Obama that did that by bringing more security to those countries and by helping actually them expand economically. Improving conditions. And, improving the conditions. Now, that takes a little while longer, but in, in the long run, it probably would have gotten us less of these immigration flows. Number two, if you actually wanted to deal with this refugee uh, uh, issue faster, you could. Instead, what we're seeing is the Border Patrol is purposely making it more difficult for people to apply for refugee status. Uh, they're not allowing them to cross the border and actually start filing their paperwork. Uh, and if they did that, you wouldn't have these huge masses of bodies uh, behind chain link fences that look like they're trying to evade the United States. But the yeah. problem with that, the problem with that is if you don't have that, then the president can't claim this huge uh, problem. Uh, you know, 80, almost you know, under Obama, we had a program where almost 99 percent of refugees actually showed up for their court dates. Right. Uh, even without that program, last statistic I, show, I saw that 89 percent of refugees will show up for the refugee claims. Hmm. So the president should do some research or have someone actually knows what they're doing over there and actually expedite the refugee process so we can actually uh, you know, discern who is supposed who is, has a legitimate claim to be here uh, under refugees and who does not Uh, And that, I think, would actually stop this kind of, uh, you know, um, scene where where you're seeing all these masses of humans just kind of piled up. That is, you know, we have normal migration flows that happen this time of year. If Mm -hmm. you actually, you know, if the president was actually competent, uh, he he would actually be able to deal with this in a manner that most Democrats and Republican presidents have in the past. Right. Uh, Let's get away from immigration for just a moment here. Are we ever going to see the full Mueller report? I think we are going to see the full Mueller report. I think we may have to fight for it. We have a right uh, to know what the Mueller report is. If the president claims that it exonerates him and condemns Democrats somehow, <laughs> then let's bring it. Uh, I'm willing to stand uh, you know, my trial by fire, uh, see what I have said in the past in regards to the, the Mueller report. Uh, I find it highly suspicious that the person who uh, basically uh, denied and excused all the illegal and unconstitutional acts of the Iran-Contra affair, somehow uh, we're going to trust with this summary of a uh, 485-page report. Uh, It's ridiculous. Like, let's release it. Uh, We have a right. The American people have a right to know what was in there. Uh, You know, I don't know what what the holdback is at this point. Right. Seems, you know, we paid for it, right? Congress paid for it. Taxpayer dollars that... It's our report. A- absolutely. That, deliver the report. Now, and you mentioned uh, Bill Barr, a cert, uh, also the author of the 19-page memo before he was nominated for attorney general, which says there's no obstruction of justice and you can't indict yeah. the president. And it right. looks to me like that's why he got the job. 
Well, certainly, and during I mean, the, he had one thing to do, right? Yeah, <laughs> which was to clear Donald Absolutely. Trump of any charge of obstruction. And and he was asked during his confirmation, would he recuse himself from the process? And he said no, and he still got the nomination. I mean, right. so wh- why is anybody surprised by this? This is, you know, you're asking, uh, you know, basically the bank robber to be. Uh, you know, cleared by his accomplice. So that just doesn't make any sense. Let the let the public decide. And at the end of the day, this is a, a political question under the Constitution of the United States. The 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 guilt or innocence, or what what happens to the president, uh, isn't really ever going to be decided by bar. Certainly, and the Constitution says that it actually gets decided by Congress. And if his acts are uh, you know, in in line with high crimes or misdemeanors or any level of obstruction of justice, we have a right to determine what happens then. Right. Um, and uh, yesterday was the deadline that uh, Chairman uh, Jerry Nadler had given uh, the Attorney General for producing the report. No surprise, uh, he did not uh, deliver the report. Uh, so I think today the the committee would vote to authorize a, su- a subpoena if necessary. Yes. Which you would support? Absolutely. Look, there's nothing that we can't see uh, as members of Congress that, the, the, that he cannot give us, that Barr cannot give us right now, or it w- that could be found in the Miller Report. I see classified information all the time. Um, so if there's anything that needs to be redacted, obviously, before it gets released to the public, uh, we would understand that. But there is p- confidential settings where we can go in, uh, you know, in, in the state in the House uh, uh, right now, mm-hmm. where we can read this report without it being leaked out or, you know, uh, in any sense, I think, compromising national security. So we've done it before. I've done it for classified information. This is no different. Right. Uh, moving on to the issue of health care. It's kind of hard to follow um, where the White House is from day to day on this because last week they joined a lawsuit saying, let's throw the entire Affordable Care Act out the window. Uh, then the president says, No, we're going to be the party of health care and we're going to produce a great new plan and it's going to come out like right away. And then Mitch McConnell says, what plan? We're not working on any plan. Um, So yesterday, yet again, Peter, if we have the president talking now saying basically we've got a beautiful plan, but we're not going to release it until we're ready to. Uh, Anyhow, here's the president. We don't have the house. So even though the health care is good, really good, it's much better than when the plan comes out, which we'll be showing you at the appropriate time. It's much better than Obamacare. Who's he kidding? They don't have a plan, do they? No, they didn't have a plan before. Um, this is very Nixonian of them. Like, I have a plan for Vietnam. I'm not telling you until after we, uh, I win the election. I mean, like, come on. Uh, who's he joking? He, he has... He certainly has not come up with a plan. He doesn't understand health insurance. I think, you know, he's never actually had to deal with health insurance. Other people dealt with him, dealt with it for him. So that's your first, you know, fault right right there. He doesn't understand it. Um, Look, the most conservative version that gets you close to universal health care, universal health care is, quote unquote, Obamacare or the ACA. Uh, you know, this program that that was started by President Obama was actually a Cato Institute uh, idea. Mm-hmm. I actually learned uh, about this even years ago when I was studying at Harvard under uh, Marty Feldstein, a uh, you know a, a, a economist Con- under uh, Ronald Reagan, conservative because, economist. Yes, yeah. and so he actually outlined this program in my uh, econ class. So you know, there is <laughs> no way that they're going to be, the Republicans can do anything. Uh, that is remotely useful, I would say, t- in terms of bringing down the cost of health care and, g- and giving more coverage uh, than what exists right now. So essentially, the only thing they can do is really destroy the whole thing and kind of give what would say junk insurance plans to people to make them feel like they have you know, proper uh, health insurance, but in the end would not make any difference. And the only way that happens, by the way, we have junk insurance plans, is you have to, get away, you have to give, uh, give away pre-existing condition protections, because if not, that increases premiums on the, on the whole end. So right. this is why, you know, the, they have no plans. They will have no plans. Um, you know, the the plan for uh, Donald Trump and Republicans is don't get sick. If you do get sick, go bankrupt, and eventually you're going to die anyway. So, right. I mean, that's basically what, what their plan is going to be. Right. Um, do you see this as a, a an issue in 2020, the way it was, health care, the way it was in 2018? I, absolutely. Um, if you, I mean, they expose their nerve, and we should make sure we t- uh, we keep touching it as often as possible this election. Right. Uh, certainly resulted in forty new seats in the forty pickups in the House of Representatives. Absolutely. And again, seems to me with the Republicans now, they're st- it, particularly, and I know some of them Republicans in Congress are hoping that the lawsuit in Texas goes down. Right. Right. Does not succeed because they're going to be stuck with having come out to totally get rid of Obamacare, replace it with nothing. Right. But a promise 
that if you reelect us, correct, we'll come up with a new plan. Right, and I suspect that they're they're actually um, uh, judge shopping right now. Uh, and, <laughs> and and you mean trying to get to another judge? Correct. Yeah, yeah. because yeah. if they if they hit like the wrong circuit court judge, uh, you know, I think they probably have a fifty fifty chance of actually getting what they don't want, which is. You know, the ACA getting struck out and then this getting into a very weird limbo situation. Right. Uh, Congressman, you and uh, head of your subcommittee have been dealing with an issue that we don't hear much about, which is the plight, um, particularly in this con- inside this country, of uh, facing indigenous women. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the reason I had a hearing on that, tell us about it. I mean, unfortunately, it's the first hearing that's ever occurred on this. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's sad. I mean, it's absolutely sad that we've allowed this to happen. Um, we have over 3,000 missing indigenous women, murdered and missing indigenous women all across this country, uh, American women, uh, and we basically have ignored it. It's, and it is Congress's job to actually have oversight over Indian country, and we've done nothing. Uh, so, you know, as soon as I became this, chairman— these, these, these women, uh, is this happening on Indian land, on reservations? Both. Or just Yeah, both. both on Indian land and off Indian land. Um, it's a, it's a it's a combination of a lot of factors, uh, but the most important factor is that you have an uncaring government, and that's us. Uh, and so we need to start pushing uh, the issue in the envelope. I just introduced legislation that uh, actually is going to is just brought got brought into amendment that we're going to actually be able to start tracking, even tracking, um, you know, where this is happening, how this is happening, why this is happening. We have no data uh, uh, that could really help us determine what you know what we can do to help the situation. And so I'm not done yet. Uh, we're going to continue pushing on this. This we kind of need a whole of government approach to this. To be honest, it's not just you know me on the Indian uh, the the subcommittee of Indigenous people, uh, but also we need the Department of Justice. Uh, we need lo- local local uh, uh, electeds in in states uh, in counties, and we need our tribal police uh, and tribal justice courts also to be involved. But none of that has occurred, um, and we just we need to turn this around. We cannot if this was you know. If this is 3,000, um, you know, Anglo women that disappeared over the span of, you know, five to 10 years, I think we would have, um, you know, the press and everybody going insane. Uh, but instead, we have this epidemic of, of women uh, of color, and we just don't have the same kind of rise uh, in terms of urgency. But we should. There are yeah. American women. There are, there are, there are uh, sisters. Why not? They just get lost in the process somehow it's a, or? Well, because it's it's a combination of many things. You know, um, there, there there some of them are in very far off uh, areas. Uh, some of them um, are you know very difficult for them to be to be found just because they do they move around a lot. You know, and and also because for some reason, and I think partly is a certain level of racism, they uh, some of these women aren't allowed to uh, to be imperfect. So if they have, uh, for example, a drug habit, uh, for some reason, oh, you know, the local yeah. police will say, well, she's you know, probably on a bender. We're not going to go looking for her, and then they find, unfortunately, that woman uh, years later. But that's not all the case. There are there are women uh, that uh, you know, and young girls that are being kidnapped uh, all the time. Uh, and um, I also fear my personal fear is, you know, if you are a predator, you know, you go to where oh, the weaknesses yeah, are. Yeah. And I and I guarantee you, there are some sexual predators out there that are clearly stalking our Native American women. You know, um, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I'm I'm totally blanking. But Peter, we had a guest in studio, uh, Congressman. Um, a couple of years ago, who wrote a very powerful book about murder on an Indian reservation it was never David the, Grant. David Grant, yeah, okay. And the book, something to do with flowers, flowers of the killing moon, flowers oh, of the I'll killing moon. Yeah. Oh my okay. god! Oh my Based god. on a true story, but, oh. tr- total true story about a family that was kind of wiped out, and law enforcement authorities. Yeah. Just look the other way. Look the other way. Look. Yeah, right now, you can't. It's very difficult to even get Amber Good alerts. Catch them. Peter, it's Good very catch. difficult to get Amber Alerts uh, for Native American uh, uh, children. If you think about that, you know, in some states you do, some states you don't. But uh, to get an Amber Alert out because of the different like uh, jurisdictions, uh, you don't necessarily get that out. Even though, you know, if if that same Native American child was off reservation, an Amber Alert would actually be uh, issued. Um, as a Marine, and I don't say former Marine because yeah. once a Marine, always a Marine, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, May not look it, but I was at one point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, the president brags about, you know, he's the best friend the military ever had. The military is in the strongest uh, position uh, uh, we've ever been in. Um, and uh, nobody takes care of the veterans the way I do. Uh, and here he is. This sort of gets back to the wall. But here he is saying, I want to build this wall, damn it. And if you won't give me the money, I'm going to take money from these military bases. Yep. Where they're going to build housing for 
for families or schools for kids yep. of uh, military and uh, – uh, yeah, it's a certain internal contradiction here. How do you see it? Well, there's a lot of internal contradictions. I mean, f- first of all, it, whether this is, you know, he's pro-military or anti-military, the most important thing, it's anti-constitution, constitutional for him to actually go around the legislative process and take money from the Armed Services Committee that we've allocated and are authorized. And I'm on the Armed Services Committee. We have said that these right. are the projects that need to be filled yeah. in, the ter- in, in terms of national de- the national defense strategy that we need for this country. And he's going around saying, no, you're wrong. I'm taking that money now. So now what's going to happen for the next, for at least for the next foreseeable future, we're going to input language into uh, the NDAA, the, the Defense Authorization Act, says you can't do that anymore because now we can't trust you, right? We always let, left a little bit of latitude for our presidents to be able to use that fund for real emergencies. For real emergencies, right. right? But you know, you're trying to com, trying to you know fulfill your dumb campaign promise does not make a national emergency. So we're going to have to change that, uh, and that's actually the biggest issue in terms of being pro-military. Look, if you want to say you're pro-military, then actually follow up with that. Don't discriminate against our transgendered uh, service members, right? Actually uh, go and, and listen to Congress about where we should be spending uh, our money. Uh, continue to actually work with us to end these endless wars. And I do give him credit for at least talking about it, uh, but he hasn't actually uh, moved in that direction. Uh, and then recognize that you know this country's strength uh, in the world is not just from – our military strength, it's actually a whole nation, whether it's, you know, a country that has, you know, uh, opportunity, equal opportunity for anyone who comes here, treat everybody uh, equally, uh, no matter what their race uh, and gender is, uh, or religion, which he seems to also have a problem with, too. There's so many other ways that we can make this country just as strong as our military. And his focus on just the brawn instead of the brain, uh, I think, is extremely uh, dangerous. And and someone more in line with this more authoritarian way than anything else. But again, these projects um, are, are are projects that have been specifically requested by the Pentagon, right? Yep. You've approved as from the yeah. Armed Services Committee that this much money for that project, right? And in effect, that project alone, right? It's Correct. not a grab bag, right? Correct. Uh, um, or a little kitty <laughs> that well, he can dip yeah. into for anything right. that he wants. Right. Well, Bill, I think you have to understand, like, the president actually looks at government as his toy, much like he looked at the Trump corporation as his toy. This is the same man that, you know, claims that he needs to cut funds here and there, but then will spend millions of dollars flying down to mar Largo uh, every weekend, right? So he, he doesn't get that, like, you can't be talking about <laughs> deficit, but then actually being costing us close to $100 million in trips to mar Largo, right? He doesn't get that the military is there to uphold the Constitution of the United States, Right. It's not there to be the president play toy and protective security of this president. And he's trying to basically align that uh, in his way. Right. He just doesn't get it. This man thinks about himself first, not about country first. And that's why you see these types of actions. Uh, government is his toy and he's got his toy plane. Yeah. <laughs> you know. This is why he can't stand the DOJ doesn't go after political enemies. I mean, this is he he just doesn't get it. He doesn't get it. And he doesn't want to get it. Right. Uh, right. <laughs> why? Why aren't you? Why aren't you launching an investigation of Hillary's emails, for example? Hey, Guess yeah. what? We've already done that. Exactly. Huh? Right. Exactly. That's so good to see you. Thanks good so to see much you, for Thanks coming for having me. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't been out to Arizona in your great state in a while. I have to uh, have to improve that. We got but... a couple more nice months before it gets hot. So. <laughs> yeah, and then stay away, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good to see you, Congressman. Congressman Ruben Gallego. You, Keep people can follow you on Twitter yep. at Rep Ruben Gallego. Yep. Right. We got it. That's all for the America's Democrats podcast. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Lewis Hyman, Stephen Perlstein, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook and Twitter. And leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. For the America's Democrats podcast, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us. Support the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page.